What's up everybody, Rob here. So this is a continuation of my look at warfare from 1500 to 1800, basically the early modern period. In a previous video, I had already covered pike and shot formations and the Spanish Tercio. If you haven't seen it already, the link to that is in the, the description box. I highly recommend you check that out, mostly so you can get context as to what I'm talking about here. But also more importantly, I care not from whence the views come, only that they do. Now, before I go any further, I just want to point out that this is a very brief overview. It is by no means extensive or in any way um, comprehensive. It's just basically something for people who are complete beginners on the subject, don't really know what's going on. I am by no means an expert on this subject. I never claimed to be. It's just something I figured was interesting and not too many people are talking about it. So I, you know, share it with all of you. And if you're looking for a more detailed analysis of these subjects, well, I'm sorry, I cannot help you there. That's you know, beyond my pay grade. So with all that out of the way, let's get right down to it. This is the birth of linear formations and the innovations of Maurice of Nassau. So our story begins with this scowling individual here. This is Maurice of Nassau, who was the second son of William the Silent. And upon his father's assassination, he became the Prince of Orange, as well as the stadtholder of the Dutch provinces of Zeeland, Utrecht, Gelderland, and, and I know I'm going to butcher this, over Yesel, look, it's there on the screen. Uh, guys, if anybody, Dutch people out there, I'm sorry I cannot pronounce any of your words. And I say this as someone who has Dutch ancestry. So I did the best I can, but you know, I suck at pronouncing foreign words in general. So you kind of come to expect that if you're familiar with my channel at all. But whatever. Anyway, moving on. So at this point, the Dutch were involved in a long and protracted war of independence from Habsburg Spain, the superpower of the era, who utilized the famous Tercio formations as a way to dominate their rivals. Now, Maurice knew that there was very little chance that the tiny Netherlands could face down the might of the Habsburg Empire. So instead of meeting force with force, he relied on a series of new tactics and strategy to achieve his victory. Now, I'm just going to point out that the bulk of this video will focus on the battlefield tactics that were devised by Maurice of Nassau, focusing particularly heavily on his infantry tactics using pikes and muskets and how they were used in conjunction with one another. I just want to point out that a massive proportion of the fighting was done basically with siege warfare. The Netherlands, as it is today, is a relatively small area, and it is very population dense, so there's a lot of towns and cities there, which of course would be fortified, because that was pretty much the standard practice back then. And a lot of the area is crisscrossed with dikes and canals and other types of waterways, and so large open field battles were comparatively rare. Siege warfare was the name of the game here, and Maurice being a very mathematically inclined individual and somebody who favored engineering as one of his favorite subjects, Dutch siege warfare played an absolutely critical role in the eventual Dutch independence from Habsburg, Spain. However, like I said, this is going to focus mostly on his battlefield tactics, limited as they were. Just keep in mind that the heavy lifting of Dutch independence was done by siege engineering, which involved lots of cannons and even more math. So, okay, just getting that out of the way. Any case, moving on. Well, any case, before Maurice of Nassau could revolutionize warfare, he had to reorganize the Dutch military. In previous eras, the bulk of armies would be levies of part-time soldiers who would be raised for a single campaign and then disbanded upon its conclusion. And of course, there would also be the ever-present mercenaries who were, let's just say, of inconsistent quality and of loyalty. So, instead of using these part-time soldiers, Maurice instituted a full-time army with a very heavy emphasis on drill and discipline. And in order to maintain this force of permanent soldiers, Maurice was forced to completely reform the government structure of the Netherlands, particularly the civil service. And the main reason for this was to ensure the proper payment of soldiers. The most common cause of desertion, of course, was lack of pay because, you know, hey, if I'm going to get shot at, I might as well get some gold along the way. And if the gold's not forthcoming, I might as well just go home. So after reforming the civil service, he also streamlined logistics so soldiers would be supplied and equipped properly for battle, with the arms and equipment being provided by the state. For example, there was the standardization of artillery pieces. They would be available in four separate calibers, and you might think that this is pretty obvious. You know, you would have your artillery pieces all of a same, basically of the same caliber. But you would be wrong. This is actually a fairly recent notion. Uh, for example, during the famous Spanish Armada, there was a major problem there where the Spanish simply could not load and fire their cannons. Well, they were poorly designed for ship-based combat. They were field pieces that they put on their ships. And they, uh, But more to the point, though, they were all of different calibers. And thanks to this logistical nightmare, the Spanish were unable to reload their cannons, or at least unable to do so effectively. So their plan was actually to go up to the English ships, deliver a broadside, and then hopefully board the English ships and take it over with just sheer weight of numbers. And the English, well, they, um, 
Well, they stayed out of range and kept picking apart the Spanish ships and, well, it basically was a huge disaster for the Spanish. But the point I'm trying to make here is that the idea of standardized artillery calibers really had not come about. It just, this was actually a very revolutionary idea. In addition to the artillery pieces, there was also the standardization of muskets to a single caliber. All of this, of course, was much to the relief of Dutch quartermasters. Maurice of Nassau also established one of the world's first military academies. At this academy, officers would be trained in various disciplines, including, but not limited to, fencing and sword fighting, wrestling, horsemanship, grappling, algebra and mathematics, engineering, siege engineering, architecture, and Maurice's new methods of warfare. But what were these new methods, I hear you ask? Well, that's pretty much it for the administrative stuff. Let's get down to the interesting part. So the Tercio that Maurice of Nassau was dealing with was a very big block of about 3,000 men. They would maneuver in units of about 3,000. Now, this was a very large, very powerful unit that could smash through pretty much anything. Unfortunately, because of its size, it was somewhat unwieldy and very cumbersome on the battlefield. Now, they did have detachments. These detachments could be broken off from the main body, but overall, the Tercio was not really famed for, and its strong point was not its mobility. So, Maurice of Nassau went in a completely different direction. Rather than using a single block of about 3,000 men, trying to match strength with strength, he divided his army into smaller groups, battalions of roughly 550 to 580 men. Now, these smaller groups were easier to maneuver, and as such, they had much more tactical flexibility. And this was just the start of his reforms. All right, so what I have here is a very crude representation of a Spanish tercio, at least the pike portion of the tercio. We'll get into the muskets in a little bit. These are Wars of the Roses set from Perry Miniatures. And I know I'm going to be doing videos on early modern warfare, 1600s, 1700s, you know, that sort of stuff, you know, pike and shot stuff. Do I buy pike and shot sets? No, I buy medieval stuff. I have an American Revolution set, you know, uh, that I'm halfway completed. I got Roman legions. I know I'm going to be doing stuff on early modern warfare, and those sets are available, but somehow, for some reason, I don't buy them. I know, that's another story for, well, I'm not, it's not there's not really a story there. I'm just weird. Any case, so, anyway, we have the Spanish Tercio, and they are in a formation 10 ranks deep. Now, again, Tercio would be in a formation of about 3,000 or so, there's only about 80 or so here, but it's, the, the important part is that it is 10 ranks. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Just trust me, there are 10. Uh, the uh, frontage across really is not very important. Now, the main strength of the Tercio is that due to its depth, uh, of course I have to much touch things, um, due to its depth, it's very hard to break. So if somebody, you know, say you managed to even break through the first line, again, pretend that they're all pikes here, and you somehow managed to break through the wall of pikes that are at you from the first couple rows, and you get to, um, you know, you say you take out the first row. You just get rid of these guys. Well, you still got to deal with all of these. It's a very deep formation. It's very dense. And therefore, it's very difficult to break through. However, this does come with some drawbacks. So one of the biggest drawbacks of this is that this is a perfect target for artillery. Or basically any type of range, uh, range unit. So say you're aiming at this guy here and you overshoot your target and you go, uh, you know couple ranks back you're still hitting somebody back here you're hitting somebody back here you're hitting somebody back here this is this is just a beautiful this is a field artilleryman's dream right here you can do a lot of damage and you don't need to be as precisely accurate so um again if a round overshoots somewhere you aim for the front rank and it overshoots you can still hit somewhere in the formation and do some serious damage to them uh, the other major drawback of this is that there is a lot of inefficiency as far as this goes, especially when things get into melee combat. So you close the distance, you're in melee combat with the uh, the enemy's formation, and again, just pretend these are all pikemen here. Um, the pikes are very long. They're about 15 to 20 feet long. It really depends on the era and the army, basically whatever they had available, but you know, 15 to 20 feet long, they're pretty long. So the first rank can be fighting, the second rank can be fighting, third rank, and maybe even the fourth, and possibly even the fifth rank, but yeah, maybe by that time you get to the fifth rank or so, yeah, it's kind of a stretch. Depends on how close they are ordered. I mean, if you can press them closer together, you can get a little more, um, a little more there. But basically the first, like, three or four rows are basically the ones fighting. The rest of the guys here in the back, like the back five or six rows, they're really not doing much of anything. They're just kind of standing there. Now, you, what you can do is angle your pikes, and you oftentimes see it. The uh, the back rows will hold their pikes straight up in the air, and then the um, uh, the rows, um, the mid rows, um, you know, the fifth, sixth ranks, they're about seventh ranks, uh, will angle it at about a 45 degree angle. And that will pr uh, provide somewhat of a degree of protection against crossbow bolts and arrows. Uh, it's sort of like an improvised roof, and it's actually reasonably effective. I mean, you wouldn't think that a pike would be able to block arrows or anything like that all that much, but, you know, if you have enough of them and these guys are packed closely enough together, 
yeah, it's, you know, fairly decent. But other than providing this screen against arrows, uh, you know, this, this makeshift uh, improvised roof, there's really not much that, you know, these guys here, um, these guys aren't really doing much of anything. The most they can do is kind of just stand there, and if somebody in front of them, um, somebody in front of them dies, well, these guys will just, you know, move up to take his place. But other than that, they're just kind of, well, they're just kind of standing there, not really doing much of anything. Another issue is because this is a very compact formation like this, it's actually relatively or much easier to flank your opponent. So uh, if you have another line of troops here, um, you can if you have more frontage, you can wrap around them fairly easily. Now, they would have people on the flanks. They would have musketeers, and I'll get to them in a minute. And they would also put cavalry on the side. There would also be... Um, the tercios would be arranged in a kind of a checkerboard pattern, so you'd have this one here, then you'd have another one back here on you know, both wings, and then others up front. Um, basically a checkerboard pattern. You, you guys know what a checkerboard pattern is. Uh, the point being, though, um, the, the frontage of each individual unit is actually reasonably narrow, and so therefore uh, flanking them, again, notwithstanding other units involved, is actually relatively... Um, well, it's much simpler than with a linear formation. These big blocks like this can very easily be flanked, or at least much more easily. This is especially true when uh, one army significantly outnumbers the other. They can simply um, keep the same depth formation, uh, formation and basically have the same uh, defensive capability, the same, you know, power if, if they decide to go on the offensive, while at the same time maintaining uh, more frontage. Okay, so when he was confronted by the Spanish Tercio, Maurice of Nassau looked at that and said, okay, these guys are based on the Macedonian phalanx. And the Macedonian phalanx were eventually defeated by the Romans. And what was the big difference in their formations? Well, instead of being a single block, the Romans used more linear formations. And behold, we have linear formation. Now, these are the exact same soldiers I had before, except instead of being in a formation 10 ranks deep, they are in a formation of 5 ranks deep. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now, linear formation like this has advantages and disadvantages compared to the block like Tercio. The big disadvantage is that you are much more spread, well, obviously you are spread thin. You are basically weaker. Five ranks deep is easier to punch through than, say, ten ranks deep. That's just simple arithmetic. Now, combat is all about risk management. So, obviously, according to Maurice of Nassau, the... This disadvantages were made up for by the advantages. Now, the big advantage, one of the big advantages here is that you're less vulnerable to artillery and other ranged weapons. So, um, say for example, now I'm sure you guys know that cannonballs tend to bounce. You're very smart people. If you're subscribed to me, you are automatically, that's a plus 10 IQ, to your IQ points right there. It's, it's science. It's right there. Don't question it. Now, because a cannonball bounces, say it caps this guy right here. Uh, this is the four, uh, in the fourth rank. Caps him, they bounces over, boom, hits this guy here, it's going to go take out this guy here. I know these guys are attached, so I'm taking out more than the guys that got hit, but just say those guys get taken out, boom, you now have that little bit of a gap right there. Now, if this was in a Tercio, 10 ranks deep, guys in um, the guys behind them, uh, ranks 6, 7, 8, they're all potentially going to get hit by this cannonball as well, and it's going to take out that many more people. Or say the gunner is, you know, not necessarily on top of his game. Let me just put these guys back. And he overshoots completely and he lands, say, over here. Now that just, it, the cannonball lands over here and it bounces on behind him. It doesn't mean anything. Now, if this was in a, a 10 rank formation like the typical Tercio, that might have been rank 7, rank 8, rank 9. That guy's getting killed and he's not doing anything. Here, it's just bouncing harmlessly on, on the ground. It's, you know, they can shoot there all they want. So because of that, you're much less likely to be, um, well, artillery and other ranged units are going to do much less damage, which is, I'm going to say, a fairly good thing because you really don't want your, um, your infantry to get shredded by the enemy artillery before they can actually, you know, do anything. I mean, if you're going to die, you might as well take some of the enemy with you. And if you're getting shot apart at range, well, that's... You know, before you can even strike a single blow at your enemy, that's sort of just a waste of resources. The next big big advantage is due to the frontage. Now, because of this, you can see here it is a much wider frontage, which means that if you have the same number of soldiers and you have more people, um, uh, more people on the flanks, it's more difficult to outflank you, and also you can outflank your opponent. Now, it's very difficult because these are all separate, but basically you can you know wrap your men around a formation, the enemy formation, and. Um, you know, basically surround them that much easier, hit them on multiple sides. Now, again, that does make you vulnerable. They can just punch through the center that much more easily, but but it is an option. You can, you know, simply surround your enemy, and yeah, they're, they're 
punching through, but then you're surrounding them, sort of like Cani in a way. Even though, yeah, I know the Romans were the victims of Cani, and this is a Roman-inspired formation, but you know what I'm trying to say. Basically, yeah, it's, again, risk management. But, um, yes, you do have the idea of more frontage, so it's more difficult to flank, and you can also flank your opponent. The other thing, too, is that you have these men here in the back. They can actually do something. Instead of the soldiers in the rear ranks, you know, uh, hypothetically these, you know, 6, 7, 8, 9, ranks 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, instead of them basically providing that roof, which basically um, provides some degree of protection against missile units, but once this thing gets caught up in a melee, a big fan lengths like that, generally you're not going to be too vulnerable to a um, the enemy missile troops because you don't want to shoot your own men, and generally speaking, they wouldn't be shooting into their own formation. So... While combat is actually joined, and, you know, the two main pike blocks um, sl slam into each other, the guys in the back rows are pretty much standing there doing nothing. Now, you have everybody actually fighting during the middle of a battle, instead of actually just kind of standing there, and at most, you know, just kind of stepping in place. If someone in front of you gets killed, you can move up and take his place, but until then, you're just kind of sitting there, uh, you know, just kind of chilling. And instead of that, you can actually, you know, earn your pay, and, you know, actually be useful. It's more... Overall, it's actually much more efficient that way. So in addition to his pikes, Maurice of Nassau also reorganized muskets. Now we have muskets here. These are Warlord Games, British Redcoats. They are muskets, flintlocks, not matchlocks, but whatever. The point is that these are a visual representation. And they were put on the side of the pike block. So you have a pike block here. And then flanking them, you would have the muskets. They'd be four abreast, so one, two, three, four. And they'd be ten deep. I'm not putting ten deep because, perf uh, perfectly honest with you, I don't feel like putting out that many. But note that this would be much deeper. This is to compensate for the incredibly slow reloading time of the matchlock musket. Volley fire is nothing new. This has been pioneered by the Spanish, possibly by other people before that. The point is... Um, um, the entire front rank firing all at the same time and then rotating is not something that he had, uh, specifically revolutionized. But through constant drilling and practice, what uh, the Dutch came up with a system known as the counter march. And the way it worked is actually fairly simple. Uh, the first rank would fire here. So these guys would all fire. And then as soon as they discharge their pieces, they would then rotate to the back. It would be much more glamorous than this. And of course, I just bro and I just broke the musket off. Yeah, nice. Uh, yeah, musket just came off this guy here. I'll blue that back later. Any case, um, as soon as these guys were clear, this rank here would open fire. The second rank would all immediately open fire. Now, once these guys here got to the back, they would uh, begin the complicated reloading process. These guys would open fire as soon as they were clear, and then they would rotate to the back. And then these guys would open fire, and they would do this in this constant revolving pattern. And because of this, they were able to keep up a near constant stream of fire on the enemy. And due to the very strict discipline that Maurice of Nassau imposed on his musketeers, they were able to fire much faster than their Spanish counterparts. In some cases, uh, according to some estimates, almost twice as fast, at least in terms of total volume of fire that was being thrown at them. So they can just put a lot of lead downrange very quickly. Now this made up for their lack of numbers, they made up for in just sheer firepower. Now, in addition to the musketeers that would be on the flanks like this, you'd have again, you'd have the, the main phalanx here, and then flanked from both sides, you'd have these columns of muskets. They also had, uh, each battalion would have somewhere along the lines of about, six, um, about 60 muskets, um, and these would be in much more open order. Just, this is a real quick demonstration here. They'd be in a much more open order, and they'd be used as skirmishers. Now, their job as skirmishers would be to move in front of the main formation, and what they would do is they would shoot at the enemy, not really doing a tremendous amount of damage, just really keep the enemy on their toes, um, just, you know, break up, try to break up the enemy formation, and just make things as difficult as possible for them, and basically screen the movement of the main body. Um, the gunpowder at the time was fairly inefficient, and more to the point, though, it would belch out these giant plumes of this bluish gray smoke uh, just watch any um you can there's there's thousands of videos on firing a, a gunpowder uh could be matchlock musket flintlock musket anything with black powder in it um these big plumes of smoke and you have enough people doing this that could completely um obscure the movements of the main body so you can actually having these guys up in front um in addition to the damage they're doing to the enemy breaking up their formation just basically being annoying as possible they're also providing a smoke screen for the uh the advance of the rest of the troops and um they can that could be used for their tactical advantage now it may seem contrary but um this these group uh, these people here they are working independently they're not in the formation like the others these skirmishers will be out in the the front of the main body so they had a degree of independence compared to their comrades uh back in the ranks but they also needed a tremendous amount of discipline 
and um, coordination because you have to basically coordinate uh, with people while you're also separated from them again in the very literal fog of battle You had to be able to maneuver and know when to fall back and when to advance and you had to do all that stuff uh, Independently you didn't have you didn't have a guy basically standing right next to you and you know oh, just if this guy's falling back Okay, I might as well fall back too. You're more separated. You're in a much more open order than you were um, in um, and say in the ranks and Therefore you need to have nerves of steel and also rock-solid discipline as well so it may seem counterintuitive, but actually these uh, the skirmishers had to be some of the most disciplined people in the entire army. And it was that discipline that was the hallmark of Maurice of Nassau's reforms. Drill and discipline were the absolute key, more so than linear formations or siege engineering or any other single factor. Like their Roman inspiration, the Dutch military would practice continually, moving in unison in various formations, say from line formation into column formation, it's easier to march when you're in column, and then move into a battle line, and then back again. And they would keep doing this back and forth for hours on end. Also, infantry could maneuver on the battlefield forwards, backwards, left, right, and in conjunction with other formations very easily. So that means that a Dutch formation could simply outmaneuver any of their Spanish opponents. They can simply, um, in their smaller battalions of about 550, 580 men or so, just run rings around their Spanish opponents. They would also move in cadence to drums, and it's much more easy to coordinate things when everybody is moving at the same pace at the same time. Now, this is not necessarily a cadence step where everybody was stepping on the same foot at the same time, you know, the very regimented stuff that you would see, say, in Napoleonic warfare that would come about uh, much later. I believe it was the Prussians, but I'm not positive on that, so don't quote me. It, we're not quite there yet, but basically you would be moving in cadence. Basically, you would be moving at the same rhythm uh, in the same tempo as the drummer. So rather than just using the drums for signaling purposes, it was also used for basically keeping the army moving at the same pace at the same time, which vastly improved coordination. And Dutch soldiers would be trained to carry out these maneuvers by rote. They would practice and practice and practice. They would train until the movements were so deeply ingrained into their memory that even in the heat of battle, they can go through the motions without thinking, without hesitation, and most importantly, they can do so in perfect unison with their fellow soldiers. The innovations that Maurice of Nassau devised were eventually codified into a single manual, one of the first manuals of its type. Now, military manuals are nothing new. The, the Art of War is, I think, the oldest printed book uh, continually published in history. It's been around since, like, for I don't, I don't even know how many thousands of years. Uh, the Romans had military manuals, Vigitius and others. The, the military manuals themselves have been around for, you know, millennia. The big difference is that while those manuals are for generals and for commanders and basically how would they operate and how would they run their armies, whereas this manual was for pretty much every, well, it was for the officers, but it was basically showing the minutia of how to actually run a military. Basically, it was running an army for dummies. For example, like you see here, this is a demonstration of the various steps needed to load and fire a matchlock musket. It's these type of things that were usually absent in previous military manuals. It would just say, okay, have your muskets do this. Whereas here, it shows like every single step needed to fire a musket properly. There will also be uh, demonstrations, illustrations, and as well as descriptions of forma various formations to use, how to use artillery properly on battlefield, how to arrange pike blocks, and etc., etc., etc. So basically, it was a how-to illustrated guide for warfare. Basically, it's Warfare Illustrated. I might do a video in the future going more into depth on his manual, but just suffice it to say, it's basically warfare for dummies. The Dutch Wars for Independence would last for decades, so leaders from around Europe traveled to what was known as the School of War, this area of constant conflict, and there they learned these various methods of warfare. Basically, it was a testing ground for new methods and theories, and the various people who traveled to the Netherlands would then travel back to their homelands where they would spread their ideas. And eventually, Maurice of Nassau's revolutionary new methods of warfare would make their way to Sweden, where they would inspire a particular individual who would take those ideas, adapt them to his own, and completely revolutionize warfare, and along the way get a completely kick-ass Sabaton song about him. But definitely, we're going to be talking about him at another time. So that is it for the video. Just a very quick overview of Maurice of Nassau and his reforms. We're just barely scratching the surface here, but that's really the point of this video and this series that I'm putting together. Just, you know, an introduction for people who aren't too familiar with the subject matter. Any case, hope you found it interesting and entertaining. So please hit the like and subscribe button. More videos coming out whenever I get around to it and have a good day. Or don't have a good day, your adults. Have any kind of day you want. See you later.